Well, he's joy, brother. If you've got Jesus, you've got joy. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have any joy. You've got this stuff the world's got, it doesn't last. You've got a hangover the next day instead of joy. <laughs> you've got misery. That's what the world has the day after. They have misery. They have any joy. I can go to bed joyful and get up joyful. Because Jesus is always there if you're saved. That's what really counts. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Verse 20 to 26. I want to share with you a message that I just call salvation simple, not easy. Salvation free, but not cheap. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for the mighty works which were done and you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Now I think uh, I want to answer the critics in this message today about easy believism. We've got to be careful about these phrases that we pick up. Is it easy to be saved? Well, let me ask you, is it hard to be saved? <laughs> Do we want to make it hard? Do we want to make it difficult? And so now people are complaining because we're having so many people saved. They say easy believism is what you're doing. Well, I want to take the two words simple and easy because I want to explain them to you. I looked them up in the dictionary. I thought I knew what they meant, and I, I hope that this will make it easy for you. When you use the word simple, you're talking about understanding. When you use the word easy, you're talking about activity, basically. So I think we're using the wrong phrase when we say easy believism. Uh, for instance, the, the word defined in the dictionary, simple, means consisting of only one part, not complex, not complicated, not difficult to understand. Now, I believe that defines salvation. Salvation is simple. Now, when you say easy, the word easy means that which can be mastered with ease, conducive to comfort, not difficult to perform. Now, you see, when you say easy believism, it's not a good phrase to use. When you say salvation is simple, that's a good way to say it. I like the track. We use it yet today, even though Brother Porter's gone on to be with the Lord. God's simple plan of salvation. It is not complex. It is not complicated. It is not difficult to understand. It is God's simple plan of salvation. And I want to show you from the scriptures just how simple it is. Jesus said you revealed it unto babes. Wise men and prudent men and intelligent men and educated men have a problem with salvation. They have a problem with accepting the simplicity of it. The scientific mind has a problem with accepting God. Since they can't put him in a test tube, since they can't define him in the laboratory, they can't believe in him. Their mind is too complicated, too, too mixed up with so-called data and facts. But I want to show you in the scriptures, if you're to believe the Bible, in John chapter 4. Now, if you've got a Bible, if, if someone by you doesn't have one, maybe share it with them and look upon it together. I hope yours reads like mine does. <clears throat> People are confused on the Bible today. Your Bible ought to read just like mine does if I read it carefully. Sometimes I make a mistake reading, but that's my mistake, not the Bible mistake. Your Bible ought to read the same way my Bible reads. God only wrote one book, didn't he? He only wrote one book. And this is the book of God in the English language. You follow it carefully. I thank God he has given his word to almost every language on earth, and we're still in translating it. God wrote it, 
in Hebrew and Greek, but God gave it to me in my language, and I've got it, and you read it carefully. You share it with somebody if they don't have one. In John chapter 4, in verse 13, 14, we're not going to read all of the text because we won't have time. Jesus talked to the woman at the well, and he said, in verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now, he was talking about the water that she drew up in a pail out of the well. H2O. All right. But, verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ taught here as plainly as can be, as simply as can be, that salvation is as simple as taking a drink of water. Now, brother, nothing can be more simple than that. I mean, I have a glass of water here, and I could sit down in a chair on this platform, and I could look at that glass of water. And if I were a scientific mind, I could tell you all about it. If I could put it under the microscope, I could tell you what's in the water, if it's safe, if it's clean, or whatever. And I could tell you its chemical compounds. And I could look at it, I could discuss it, I could talk about it, I could think about it, I could know about it. And then I could tell you, my dear friend, my body, my physical body, requires liquids. I must have liquids to survive. It's normally said that a man can last four days without any liquids. He would dehydrate and die, the average person, after four days, whether that 40, 96 hours. You would say right now, I'm not going to drink anything. For 96 hours, you could die. You could dehydrate and die. Your body could just dry up. So I could sit there. I could know all the medical facts, all the scientific facts, all the logics of it. I could sit there and look at it, talk about it, know about it and sit there and watch it for four days and drop over dead of thirst. Now, what I simply have to do, I wouldn't have to know what the chemical compound of water is, H2O. I wouldn't have to know that. I wouldn't have to know the medical facts of my body requiring liquids. All I'd have to do is drink it. And if I drank it, I'd live. And if I didn't drink it, I'd die. Now, you don't have to know a lot of theology to be saved. You don't have to know a lot of facts to be saved. All you have to do to know to be saved is that you're dead in sins, that you're thirsty, that you're without Christ, that there's no hope for you, and that only He can save, and by faith, drink that water. And you're saved. Simple as that. Simple as that. Let me give you another one. Look at John chapter 6, verse 31. John chapter 6, verse 31. Jesus again is speaking. Well, here the, the Jews say, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. You remember the story of the Israel's, uh, Israelites wandering in the wilderness, hungry. God rained down bread from heaven. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me uh, shall never thirst. Now, the Lord Jesus tells us again to allude to something else. Salvation is not only as simple as drinking a glass of water, but salvation is as simple as eating food. Go back to my illustration. It works every time. I've got, I've got some food. Take the bread because the Lord's talking about bread. I've got a slice of bread there or two slices of bread. There are people in this world right now that would, would give, listen, they would be glad to feast on the food that we throw away. They would feast on the food that we throw away in America. So I've got the bread sitting there. I sit down again. I say, now listen, a good, healthy man with a good, healthy body can probably survive as long as 40 days without any food. Now, a 13-year-old boy can't. Four hours is his limit. You ever see a teenager? Four hours without food. And they say, I'm dying of starvation. You want a definition of the bottomless pit? A teenager is a good definition of that when it comes to putting, putting food away. But here it is. I say, okay, I know I can survive 40 days. I've got, I've got excess, uh, for sake of a better word, fat. That's what it is. 
it's just stored up energy. That's what fat is, stored up energy. I've got a lot of energy. I just don't have the strength to use it, that's all. But, uh, but I've got all this energy stored up, so I said, I know it's going to last 40 days. We, we heard of some men, I think it was over in Ireland, in the conflict over there and the civil strife they're having. They went on a hunger strike in jail, and some of them lived, I think, 60 days or 65 days. They had water, but they had no food. Of course, it was a terrible way to die. They died slowly. Organs of their bodies quit functioning. They lost their eyesight, their hearing, and everything finally died. So I say 40 days in general. Again, I could sit there. I could tell you all about that bread, how it's made, what the ingredients are. And I could know the medical facts that my body requires food and bread is the staff of life. And I could sustain my life if I would eat that. I could sit there and know it, talk about it, think about it, but not do it. And I'd die. But if I eat it, I live. Now, Jesus said, salvation, going to heaven, being saved, having your sins forgiven, having eternal life is as simple as eating a slice of bread. I'm giving another one. In John's Gospel again, chapter 10 and verse 9. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 9. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And you want know just to walk through a door? <laughs> I mean, we're in the auditorium. Oh, sanctuary. We're in the sanctuary this morning. There are two, four, six doors. There are eight doors. There are ten doors to get to the outside. You're going to have to go through that door if you want to get out of this building. Unless you're pretty powerful, you think you can walk through that wall. It's a whole lot easier going through the door, let me tell you. If you want to get out of this auditorium, you're going to have to go through that door. You've got to walk through the door. It's a very simple thing. It's not difficult to do that. You don't have to have a magnificent mind. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to have much education to know that if I want to get outside of this building, I'm going through the door. Now, Jesus said that's all you have to know to be saved. I'm the door. Enter in, and you'll be saved. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's pretty simple, isn't it? I'll give you another one in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, if you will. Romans chapter 6. This one of my favorite verses. Oh, I love this verse. I love the book of Romans. But this verse here, 23, the last verse of Romans chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death. Now, folks, you need to learn that verse. Wages are something you pay. You men that work, you women that work for a living, you understand what I'm talking about. You may, you may get a salary, you may get paid by the hour, but whatever it is, you have an agreement when you go to work for a company or for an individual that they're going to pay you so much a week, they're going to pay you so much an hour, whatever your agreement is, that is your wage. If you do your job, they owe you that money, and if they don't pay it, they're crooked. You pay what you agree to pay if they do the work they agreed to do. Now, that's simple. That's what you earn. Now, God said, you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners, everybody's sinners. All Americans are sinners, all Haitians are sinners, all European are sinners, all white people are sinners, all black people are sinners, all educated people are sinners, all uneducated people are sinners. Nobody's exempt. All have sinned. Everybody hadn't committed murder, but some have. Everybody hadn't robbed, but some have. Everybody hadn't committed adultery, but some have. We don't have the same sins, but we've all sinned. Come short of God's glory perfection. Now, he says the payment for your sin is death. You say, I'm not going to pay it. I'll stand at your casket and laugh at you, brother. You are going to pay it. You're going to die. This old body is sin. This old body is a sinful body. And this old body is going to die because of sin. The soul has died because of your sin. Death is separation. That's all it is. If you're here today and you're not saved, you're a walking dead man. You're a walking dead woman. You're a walking dead young person. Before God, you're dead. You're separated if you're in your sin. Now, the wages of sin is death, but look at this. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift. Now, Jesus Christ said that salvation is as simple as receiving a gift. Now, you don't have to tell a kid much about receiving a gift. I mean, you just hold it out, and you wrap it up, and you put a bow on it, you tie it, you make it look pretty, and you offer it to them, and, brother, they'll grab it. Say, here it is, 
It's free. It's yours. I want to give it to you. But you wrap up salvation in the most eloquent words you can find. You preach the nicest sermon. Uh, you talk about the love of God. You talk about eternal life. And you talk about the simplicity of it. And you paint the picture and you wrap it up and, and, and put a bowl around it and offer it to the world. And they say, no. No one. You offer a thirsty man a drink of water. He says, no, I don't want it. You offer a hungry man a slice of bread, he says, no, I don't want it. Now listen, brother, if you were dying of thirst, I offered you a drink of water, you'd gulp it down. If you were dying of starvation and I offered you a slice of bread, you'd grab it and eat it. If this building were on fire and I told you the way to safety is through that door, you'd run through it. You wouldn't walk through it. If I told you here's the most valuable thing in the world, you can have it for nothing, here it is, take it, you'd grab it. But I tell you on a spiritual plane, there is no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ and His blood. It is simple. It is plain. It is easy. There is no other way. And man says, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. Now why? I'm going to stay with this simple theme and give you three simple reasons why man does not accept God's simple plan of salvation. First of all, he doesn't accept it because of religion. Religion is the curse of mankind. Religion will take more people to hell than anything else. Religion. I'm talking about religion. Look at Matthew 23, if you will. For a moment, we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I'm going to show you one in particular. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, is talking to religious people. Oh, boy, you've got to pray for our secretaries here at the office when I'm preaching these sermons on the radio. They really get it. I'm, I'm not in the office all the time, and they answer the phone. Oh, my. If you want somebody to attack you, you attack their religion. You attack their religion, boy, and they'll hate you. I mean, they hold on to that religion. I mean, they won't defend Jesus Christ, but they'll defend their religion. They won't defend the Word of God, but they will defend their religion. You can attack the Word of God. Why, the Word of God's being laughed at and scoffed and mocked and attacked every day, and nobody calls up. <laughs> and Jesus Christ is being blasphemed, and God's name is being cursed, and nobody calls up. But you attack their religion, and they'll hate you. Now, here's Jesus talking to the most religious crowd of his day. Biggest religionists there were. Look at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And by the way, hypocrites is the nicest word he uses there to describe them. He really gets tough after that word hypocrite. That's the nicest word. Woe unto you, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Jesus said, bad enough. You fellows want to go to hell with your religion. That's bad enough. But you're shutting the door. You're closing the door. You're blinding the minds of others. And you're stopping them from going in. Bad enough you want to believe that salvation is by good works. Bad enough you want to believe that your church can save you. I want to tell you something, brother. And I say it with no apologies or no hesitancies about it whatsoever. This church, nor no other church, can save you or save anybody else. In any church. Protestant, Roman, Catholic, Jewish, cultists, and any church, or all of them put together, that can redeem one soul from the fires of hell. Not one of them. There isn't any man or all men together. No preacher, no religious leader. No set of rules or confirmations or baptism or rituals or payments or prayers or anything else that can save one single soul from hell. That's all religion. Religion's keeping people out of heaven today. Religion is barricading the door to heaven. Religion will not take you to heaven. Jesus Christ will. I'll tell you something else that will keep you out of heaven. In John chapter 3 again, the Gospel of John chapter 3. Look at this carefully with me. John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light 
He has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. I'm going to tell you why people don't get saved, because they love sin. They just love it. They love it. People don't want to come to a church that preaches the Bible because they love to live in sin. The, drug, the, 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 uh, the dope takers are not going to come to our church. The drug pushers are not going to come to our church. The harlots aren't going to come to our church. The queers aren't going to come to our church. They're not going to come here because we're going to preach against their sin. Wickedness. They're not going to come here because they love their sin. And when you come face to face with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, He will reprove your sin. And you will either give up your sin and turn to Christ and be saved, or you run away. You know, even in our country where it's becoming rather easy to be involved in great sin, men sin mostly at night. They do it in the darkness. See, the, the bar rooms are always dark. They don't light up the bar rooms. They don't, they don't have bright lights in the bar rooms. People want to be in the dark when they get drunk. They don't, they don't sit out here in the daytime normally and smoke their pot and, and, and shoot their arms up. The drug, the drug addicts don't. They do it in the alley. They hide somewhere. They do it in the darkness. They don't want to be seen. Because the light shows up their great wickedness and sin. And so they hate the light. Don't turn the light on. Turn the lights out. I don't want to be seen. They enjoy the darkness. And because of that, they don't come to Jesus Christ because he is the light of the world. Let me give you another one. This is the final one. Proverbs chapter 29. I've quoted this enough times that you ought to know it by now. But let me give it to you. Proverbs 29, verse 25. The fear of man, underscore that now, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord should be saved. I'll tell you why people don't get saved. Because they're afraid, because they're cowards. If you're not saved today, it's because you're a coward. A coward. Coward, you hear me? Coward! You're afraid! You're a coward! You're a sniveling coward! You've got to run with the crowd. You don't have the guts to stand up alone. You're a coward! Whatever the crowd does, whatever the group does, that's what I'll do. They drink, I'll drink. They commit adultery, I'll commit adultery. Whatever they do, I'll do. You don't have the guts to stand up for Jesus Christ. You don't have the courage to stand up for what's right. You're a coward. You're afraid of men. You're afraid of men. Somebody will laugh at me. Somebody will make fun of me if I become a Christian. Oh, man, if I, if I start acting like a Christian, if I start living right, if I start saying, no, I won't drink, no, I won't take drugs, no, I won't listen to that music, no, I won't go to that place, why, well, they'll think I'm funny, they'll think I'm strange, they'll make fun of me, I'll lose my friends, and you're afraid, you're a coward. I'll never forget, I told the folks the other day, when I was a boy, one of my, one of my favorite priests, I was a little fella, was old Harry Ironside. He's a great, great preacher, great man of God. When he was growing up, even back in those days, there were peer pressure like there is today. And his mother was a Christian. And as a young man, he was growing up, and he got mixed up in some of those sins that young people get mixed up in. And his mother would pray for him, talk to him about the Lord. And one day he came in, and she said, Harry, you need to settle this matter with Christ and get saved. He says, Mother... If I give up those things and I get saved, my friends will laugh at me. And his mother, I believe, had the best answer of any I've ever heard. She said, Harry, your friends can laugh you into hell, but they'll never laugh you out. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. 
God's simple plan of salvation. You can be saved today just by receiving Jesus Christ. You'll be lost today by rejecting Him. Let's bow our heads in prayer.